Today we are meeting on Lutruita, Tasmania, Aboriginal land, sea and waterways. I acknowledge with great respect the traditional owners of this land, the Pawala people, upon which we meet today. We pay respects to elders past and present as the knowledge holders and sharers. We honour their strong culture and knowledges as vital to the self-determination, well-being and resilience of their communities. We stand for a future that profoundly respects and acknowledges Aboriginal perspectives, culture, language and history. Good morning, everybody. Let me add my welcome to, to, to that of Leslie. Uh, as I was driving in here today, I was thinking, oh, I hope the rain keeps off. And then my next thought was, oh, perhaps we could do with a, a bit of rain after all. So if it's going to rain, we want a good lot of rain, or we want no rain. We don't want anything that, uh, that, that lands in the middle. A year ago, we were celebrating having built the dairy and the irrigation and what have you, uh, the investment of the state government of the university on, onto this farm. Uh, the state government gave us $5 million approximately and, and the university gave us $2.5 million and that was shared mostly on this farm but, but also on the veggie farm as well and that enabled us to build the, um, uh, the, the dairy parlour and, and, and the, uh, the, the slurry storage and the irrigation dam and the irrigation, and, and, and irrigation system and what have you. And frankly, this time last year, we were celebrating the miracle of having got all of that done through COVID, through everything tripling in price of the difficulties of getting stuff transported around the world. And, and, and I don't think in my entire career I've been more relieved than, uh, that, than the moment that that, that that got built. Am I too loud? All right. <laughs> oh, really? Okay. All right. Um, yeah, so last year we were, were celebrating having, having got the facility done. This year we hope to talk about what we've done. What we've done with that confidence that's been put in us and, and how we are delivering for Tasmania, for Tasmanian dairy, the dairy industry in Tasmania and, and, and what we're doing. This farm exists for at least four reasons. Firstly, to underpin production milk production, dairy production in Tasmania. Today we're going to hear about the, um, the, the, the farmlet trials, we're going to hear about the virtual herding work uh, led by Megan, Megan and, and also the, the, uh, some, le some work on, on legume pastures and that's going to be uh, spoken to by, uh, by Rowan, Rowan Smith. Not only does this farm exist to underpin production, but it's no use having production if that production only lasts 20 years. We've also got to think about sustainability. The sustainability of our soils, the sustainability of our systems, how, what are the pollutions that, that, that we're uh, creating, how we can reduce inputs. Um, we've got to solve, we've got to use less nitrogen, we've got to use less phosphorus, we've got to use less fo uh, fossil fuel. And, and that sustainability is also an important output of um, of this farm in order to ensure that the dairy industry is sustainable in, in, in the long term. Thirdly, this farm exists for impact. There's no use doing research if all that ever happens to it is that it's written up into a journal article, gets put on a dusty shelf, and that's the last that anybody really reads of it or sees of it. We've really got to communicate and connect with our farming community We've got to, the research that we do has got to be driven and informed by that farming community as well. We have the relationship with Dairy Taz, we have the Taz Farm Innovation Hub, which is part of TIA, and, and that, those, those relationships and that work is, is to exactly drive that, is, is to kind of listen and to communicate the, the results of the re research that we do. A fourth reason why this farm exists is education and training. It pleases me enormously that every time I turn up to this farm, just by chance, there happens to be um, a school group or, or a TAFE group. We've got a, a, a strong and growing relationship with TAFE and their students come on here fairly regularly. Or there's a farmers group uh, do, doing something or other as well. And, and, and absolutely, that, that is a core reason for this farm as well. And um, I think we're going to hear a little bit about that today as well uh, from, from Sandy. So, welcome. It's great to see so many people here. 
and I hope you enjoy today. We are really well supported um, in, in running this field day. And so firstly, I'd like to thank um, Dairy Taz because they have been helping out with sign-in and with setting up the computers and, and all um, sorts of things. So really appreciate um, the strong relationship that we have with Dairy Taz and their willingness to help us um, when we put on events like this. Um, we also have the Taz Farm Innovation Hub in the back um, corner there with Maria. So Maria's got a few um, informational things there and we'll be ch chatting a little bit with, with us this afternoon and they also sponsored the coffee van which is due to leave about 10 30 so if you didn't get your um, free coffee um, you can discreetly sneak out now and, and make sure that you get a, a hot drink and I'll do some more thank yous at, um, at the end of the day but they're just a couple of the um, organizations that have been really um, helpful in, in getting this day um, set up and running so Enough with the introductions from me. I am going to now hand over to James um, to do a little bit of an update on what's been happening at the research farm for the last, um, I, I think it's been probably 16, 17 months since our last field day. Yeah, so thank you, James. I'm James Hills. For those who don't know me, I uh, lead the Livestock Production Centre within Tia and the farm sits within that centre. And uh, what I wanted to do now was Rather than hearing a lot from me, I wanted to introduce Andrew. So Andrew is our new farm manager. How long have you been here for? A month. A month. Okay. <laughs> and he's going to tell you a little bit about the, about the farm and what's happening on the farm. Um, and, and then we can move into some of our presentations. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, John. Right. I'd just like to welcome everyone onto the farm today. Um, I'll try and fill you in as best as I can. Um, and if you have any more questions afterwards, just come and find me. I'll be floating around all day. So... Um, yeah, so we've got 220 hectares here on farm. We have 350 cows we're milking. That is split into five separate mobs at the moment. Um, we've got a main herd of 240 cows um, and then the farm, four farm herds that you'll hear about today as well. So there's three lots of 29 and a 26. Um, so they're all milked at the same time, but they get bought in in different mobs. So we start with the main herd then we move on to the farmlet herds and yeah that's sort of the process of our milking. Milking twice a day, um, at the moment we are feeding quite heavily in the main herd. The farmlet cows are fully irrigated so we haven't had to feed too much to them yet um, but that may come depending on what the season does. We do have a bit of an issue with the armyworms crawling around, you probably all noticed. So we're dealing with that at the moment as well and like everyone around here we've got Quite, we haven't had rain for six weeks now, so it's been quite dry. That's why we're feeding so heavily at the moment. Yeah, so we certainly are looking for rain. I think like most people, our irrigation dam, our main one, is empty. We've got about three others left, so we've probably got about 20 days of, of irrigation left. Um, and being fully irrigated, we've got 30 odd hectares, so that'll disappear fairly quickly. Um, so we're looking for some rain yeah. uh, at this time. One of our major projects here is around our farmers, and as, as Mike has been saying, we upgraded the infrastructure on this farm to enable us to do farmlet style research where we've got a systems approach to understanding some of the challenges that we face as an industry. And so in the farmlet study, our main aim when we originally were thinking about setting this project up was to see whether we could achieve about 2,000 kilos of milk solids per hectare, um, produce about 20 tonnes of pasture, uh, dry matter per hectare with about 150 kilos of N. So that was kind of our, our target uh, in a sense. Um, the strategy that we were looking at in terms of achieving that was to increase species diversity and to look at uh, increasing biological nitrogen fixation. So the key measures that we're, we're doing, and we'll talk a little bit more about that, about that later, is, is pasture utilisation. We want to see how much pasture uh, we're able to utilise. Uh, we're looking at pasture species composition and its nutrient value, and we're certainly looking at milk, milk solid production. So we're collecting a lot of data here to try and understand the impact of the treatments that we have on our farm here to, to achieve that aim. Um, if we think about the, the treatments that, or the farmlets, the four herds that we currently have here, um, you'll notice they're colour coded. Blue is the commercial uh, control, which is our 300 kilos of N per hectare farmlet with just ryegrass and some clover, uh, which we would call the industry standard mix under irrigation, so a very commercial high input um, irrigated system. Our second herd, we're looking at 
the impact of reducing that nitrogen down to 150 kilos. So it's exactly the same, except that it's half the amount of nitrogen. So we're saying, okay, over the three years that we'll be collecting the detailed data, what impact would that have if we're only using um, about 150. The reason we've gone with that is that no, there's a lot of legislation around that is, is forcing us to reduce our total input to less than 200 kilos of N. Um, so certainly we see that in New Zealand and we see that in other places as well. So, so what impact does that have? And so we're going to measure that. The third farmlet is saying, well, okay, if we think there's going to be an impact, how can we mitigate that impact? So w that third farmlet has um, less grass and, uh, and, a, and a greater proportion of legumes, 30% legumes, and uh, the introduction of some herbs, so plantain, uh, in this particular farmlet. So that's just a way of saying, no, based on the functional traits of those particular pastures uh, and species, um, do we think we can overcome any potential um, loss through reduced N? The fourth farmlet is, um, uh, it's kind of sits out there on its own a little bit. It is, it is um, no, some people might refer to it as more of a regenerative ag approach to, to farming where there's no nitrogen put on that farm at all, no synthetic nitrogen um, put on that farm at all, and we've in, increased the diversity of the species that are planted. So we've got a number of different grasses, and there's 40% grasses, 30% legumes, 30% herbs, but then the legumes we've introduced a number of different clovers, red, strawberry and white clover, and then plantain and chicory. So that was the, the key um, component of that. And we're not putting any synthetic N on to that system um, and we'll be looking at other amendments that will go into that system. So, so they're the four treatments, the four farmlets that we have set up. Um, this is the, the setup of those farmlets uh, here on the farm. So we've got 32 paddocks, eight paddocks of one hectare each for each of the farmlets, and you'll notice that we've set it up in blocks to make sure that we've accounted for any variability across the farm. So that's the standard way that we've approached that. Um, and each of those Paddocks are colour coded, so the cows have got a colour code on them, the paddocks are colour coded, uh, our, our halter app is colour coded so that we know exactly which animals are in which, which paddocks so that we make sure we don't get mixed up. Um, because we keep the same cows, the same herds on the same paddocks right through the season. Um, and so that's the way that that's been set up, fully irrigated across that area of the farm. So what I'm going to do is just quickly go through some of the major activities that have, um, that have been through to set this up. because. What you'll see is when Peter presents some of the results, these farmlets are doing extremely well. So we want to try to work out, well, you know, where have we come from in terms of establishing these farmlets? So back in March 2021, so that's three years ago, we actually started the original grid sampling of that whole area to make sure that we could understand what the fertility was. And then we did a whole heap of initial groundwork, ploughing it to 200 millimetres, um, turning it all over, putting a whole heap of amendments into that system. So up, uh, on average, about 76 0.6 tonnes of lime, but our application of lime was based on our gridded soil sampling and it was done as a variable rate. So we covered our area to try and get a standard amount of nutrition right across the whole area. Um, so there was certainly a, a reasonable amount of work to get the nutrition pretty standard right across that area. And then we planted some Italian uh, ryegrass right across the whole area um, uh, in the early days. So that's, that's some of the example of the, uh, the ryegrass anyway. Um, now, after that, we, we did some grazing and cut some silage off that, and then we installed our irrigation system, which caused a little bit of um, you know, digging up of, of, of the area, um, put some more fertiliser on, and then in March 2022, so a year later, we planted out the farmlet paddocks. Now, you don't want to read the stuff at the bottom I put there as a reference in case anyone asks me any questions as to what the grass mixes were, um, and people can have access to that later if they want. But essentially, each of our farmlets were planted um, with those proportions of um, grasses and, and, uh, and legumes and, and herbs that we, we mentioned before. So that was in March 2022. Here's the, uh, no, the irrigation work, there's about 11 kilometres of pipeline put in to, to be able to put all of our solid seed irrigation in. And there's all of the paddocks that have been planted right across that area um, back in March 2022. After that, we, we observed you know, the, uh, the establishment. And by the time we got to May 2022, <coughs> we made a decision to terminate the clover. We actually had a really good clover take, but the problem was we had a whole heap of broadleaf weeds came in. Now, we did what we could to try and deal with that initially because we had fallow ground and we sprayed it out, and then, but when we went and installed all the irrigation, we did a whole heap of disturbance again. And so we had to then deal with that disturbance, and then we ended up with a whole, um, whole heap of broadleafs that came into that system. And so we had to go through a process of broadleaf spray right across the area between June and September 2022. And then we had to prepare for 
re sowing the clover, obviously with the broadleaf application, back into to our farmers in September and October 2022, and then November we had our next maintenance fertiliser put on. So if you look at some of these here, you'll notice that you can probably see the plantain amidst the weeds. Um, there's a whole heap of fumitry in the top one, there's a whole heap of uh, cape weed um, across those paddocks. It was just going to be impossible to be able to manage that in that current scenario. So we had to go through and clean that up initially, and then um, we then went and planted our clover back in. But in order to get the clover established, we were a little bit worried that the, the rye grass was going to be very, very competitive and make it very difficult to establish our clover. So we actually did a whole heap of work to be able to, um, and I'll just see if I've got that there, uh, to prepare for re, re the clover. So we did a whole heap of mulching, raking and grass removal and scarifying to make sure that we had a, 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 an area prepared post-grazing on each of those paddocks to be able to properly plant that clover in. So we went to quite a bit of work to do that and I think in reality we probably overdid it um, and you'll see, see that in a bit. So we re our clover in October 2022 um, and then November 2022, May 2023, and then just recently we've done some other topping up of species just to get us back to um, what we wanted uh, in, in terms of the uh, composition of our, our sites. And so there's the, uh, the paddocks, and we'll go out and have a look at those um, with their, their mixtures of pastures. And, and what you'll notice is there's a heap of clover out there. So we're very successful in establishing our clovers, and there's our happy cows um, and people. <laughs> um, in terms of the botanical compositions then, farm at one, we were aiming for 80-20 ryegrass clover. Um, what we actually have at this point in time, and remember right now is the peak time for clover, so it's an average, so it will be less in winter, so it'll average out. But at the moment, we've got about 66% clover by composition and 34 uh, ryegrass and 34% clover in, in farm at one and two, but they're similar, which is good because they're the comparisons between 300 and 150. Farm at three, we have slightly more um, Ryegrass, 66, uh, no, what are we, farm at three, 55% ryegrass and slightly more clover, so 40% clover there. And we've only got 5% plantain. We're really struggling to keep that plantain uh, in, our, in our system at this point in time. In the fourth farmlet, um, we've actually got probably too much ryegrass, 42% ryegrass, 38% clover, and then you've got some tall fescue, coxfoot, chicory, um, and then 7% plantain. So that's, that's the latest botanical composition, but remember that's one snapshot over a period of time. Um, and we've got other data that shows the change in that over time as well. I was just giving you the snapshot of what it is now. So struggling with plantain. Um, some of the measures that we're doing on the farm. So pasture covers and growth rates. So we're doing weekly plate meter walks. We're doing pre and post plate meter measurements. We're doing botanical compositions from our grab samples uh, on our transects. We're doing lots of um, nutritive value. We're doing a whole lot of work with the soil and soil properties, so soil cores. We're collecting milk, obviously, from our milk meters for every individual animal and milk quality through our fortnightly herd tests across all of our farmlet herd animals and then a whole heap of animal measurements. So what you can see is we're in doing intensive measurements so that at the end of this we can do a proper systems analysis of the economics of the whole system. So we're getting data for, for, for everything um, within this particular farmlet. There's a little bit of additional work we're doing around nitrogen. So we're doing carbon sequestration. We've taken cores at the beginning down to 80 centimetres and we're doing a whole lot of work on the carbon and we'll see what impact um, the different treatments have over time. And we're doing some work with, with some PhD projects around quantifying the, the nitrogen that's provided by free living versus the, the, the rhizobia. So we're trying to ask the question, now where's the nitrogen coming from within these systems? So there's quite a bit of work going on with a number of PhD projects um, in this project as well. Now I'm gonna hand you over to Peter and he's just gonna give you some update on where we're at in our production. I'm going to show you initial results, but keep in mind this is all preliminary for two reasons. The trial is going to last three years, not uh, nine months. And um, uh, some of the results that we have are running results, which might still change a little bit when, at hindsight, calibration results come in. But we want to show you as much as we can at this point in time, so preliminary. We set out to try and get to 20 tonne of dry matter grown per hectare. We set out to have 2,000, no, more than 2,000 kilo milk solids per hectare. That's what we aimed for. Now, James already mentioned the farmers are doing very well, and this actually basically, and that's what I mostly will show, no difference between the farmlets yet, or as of now. There's only one crucial difference. 
zero nitrogen on farmland for? Who would expect that not to reduce in growth rates? We did, we used common sense, so we reduced the stocking rate, and it turns out the growth rates are not lower, so that is understocked. So the only difference for farmland for is less cows, is less milk solids, and much more uh, grass into silage, instead of being about balanced. For the rest, it's about the same. Um, our cows are producing very well, so that's why we will be at the higher end of the amount of concentrate fed to the cows. Uh, we were aiming somewhere between 1.2 and 1.5, we'll probably end up uh, near 1.5, but that depends on a few things. So that is where we are at, and I'll show you some of these results. These are the growth rates that we have had so far. And you can see a bit of a wave pattern. The black line is for farmland one, two, and three, the break-even point that we need to fully feed them grass. They are eating about 17 kilogram matter per cow per day is what we think. You have to keep in mind in this trial, there are no heifers in these groups. It was a decision made, heifers bring noise in your data. So these are second and higher lactation cows, up to six lactation cows. So they will have a higher yield than on average, but they are eating 17 kilos, so high break even, and you see occasionally we drop underneath, and especially earlier in the season, uh, before st grass starts growing well here, we have to put in a bit of silage. So, uh, but we also can make silage and we will know at the end of the season how that balances out. But partial growth rates on itself, okay. The uh, wave pattern, although, uh, uh, however, um, uh, brings in challenges. Occasionally we have to drop in a little bit of silage to not uh, eat into the cover too much. Milk solids per cow, 2.5 on average. Still probably doing 2.4 at the moment. We didn't want them to be that high, but that's what the cows decided to do. We started that three kilo uh, dramatic rain at calving. We ramped them up over about two weeks to six kilo dramatic, and we keep them there until uh, after mating. That's what the cows decided to do, and eating 17 kilo dramatic grass. So that's why the cows are doing very well. Fat and protein, you see it's all about the same. There's a little bit of a difference between the individual herds, and that might in the end be a treatment difference, we don't know. But um, the milk solids is about the same, but there's a little bit of a difference in volume and components. Um, what we also have, um, our cows are wearing halter, so GPS, so we can see in which paddock they are, color-coded, so we can see if uh, the cows are in the right paddock and in the right mob. Uh, but it also, uh, we have that uh, in use for behavior, so it tells us the minutes grazing, the minutes ruminating, and et cetera, of the cows. That's what you see here. There are some fluctuations, but these differences are quite often mostly because you drop in silage, because there's not enough in the paddock, so uh, eating silage is much more efficient than eating grass less time needed. So if you go to rumination, then you again see if there's silage in it, slightly more fiber that can jump a bit, but again, all about the same. Um, we don't know everything yet. You can see that rumination drops down a bit. Um, uh, that might be because we are past the regenerative phase of grass and, and slightly shorter grass where they occasionally go in, but uh, we'll look at that later. Body condition. We, are, we were still feeding six kilos uh, dry matter concentrate uh, a month ago. We are slowly going down. We are at the moment at four kilos. But um, if you look at the body condition, where they are right now, there is an ideal range of body condition. And that ideal range is about here. So they are at the bottom end of the ideal range, and we don't want them to drop too far. So if you pull out grain, they probably first produce from their reserves, and then we export the problem of too low body condition to, other, uh, to another season. And if you look at body condition, our cows do have their odd normal challenges. Occasionally it drops down a bit, as you can see here. So they do run uh, their occasional challenges as you would have in a normal farm. We also have body weight. Body weight uh, for, uh, follows a similar pattern. As you can see, not much of a difference. It sometimes goes down, has to do with room and fill and so on, and just that the reserves are recovering a little bit, but it's mostly impacted by room and fill. And again, you see a lot of changes where sometimes you see when we have to drop in silage, they fill up a bit, and when you go back to uh, grass only again, the flow rate is a bit higher and they might fill up less, but they go through their uh, challenges. Growth rates, yeah, as I mentioned before, that is where we are at. Not much difference between the farmlets. 
how can a beef a farm at four? Don't we need nitrogen to grow these paddocks? So, what do you do normally on your farm? 30 kilos of nitrogen per round, roughly, somewhere between 25 and maybe 35, I'll go to the higher side. You grow 1,500 kilos of matter. Cows in at 3,000, residual at 1,500. If this would be the only nitrogen available, you only have 14.5% crude protein. Can you grow grass when grass is only 14.5% crude protein? No, it has been 18, 19. So what happens in reality? You have your cows as fertilizer spreaders in your paddocks. They don't do it even, they do it in piles and pudder, uh, puddles, but they do spread nitrogen in the paddocks. So we have a stocking rate of 3.9, so that is fully irrigated. What you see here is you have to assume a certain amount of effective end per cow stocking rate per hectare, per round. If I have that at six, that's about 23, we get to 58, and suddenly you are at 24% crude protein, and your grass is growing. Where is that coming from? Your cows eat a certain amount of feed, there's a certain amount of protein in it that uh, is a certain intake, only a small component goes in milk and the rest is excreted. About 100 kilos or so, depending on the amount of protein in the diet and how much they eat. So Europe deals with this all the time. Here are Irish results that show what they expect that uh, comes out of the backside of the cows. So if you then look at these calculations, we are somewhere between, say, 5 and 7 kilo effective N per cow stocking rate per round. And that varies a bit. Uh, there are some assumptions. Um, one of the things that James talked about is nitrogen use efficiency. Plantain can help improve nitrogen use efficiency. I have this here about 50%. It can be lower, it can be higher. So there are some variations. It's just to show you general numbers. How do we know if the diet is high or low in protein? Um, milk urea concentration, so a little bit of the nitrogen ends up in the form as urea in milk. Non-relevant for us humans, but it is in there. And if you look at um, the in this case, it's uh, the man concentration. If it's very low, below this threshold, there's not enough protein in your diet. Nitrogen is a building block for protein. If you are above 20, you are truly wasting, and you might get an ammonia smell in your dairy. So what have our cows produced? Every two weeks, there's a herd test, AMPM, the average for the day. That's where our cows are against that top line. So the diet must have... 20% crude protein, or else they don't have this amount of wasted nitrogen. No difference between the treatments, also not farmed at four. What do we have in it? Clover. Clover, if it's functioning well, uh, the nodules on the roots um, do have the potential to bind nitrogen out of the air. How much it can bind? There's a lot of debate about it. Uh, Rowan Smith um, uh, knows a lot about that, so he is the person to ask a little bit more uh, in the paddock when we are there. Uh, depending on the percentage of clover, there's a certain amount per ton dry matter that can be bound. I sometimes hear maxima per year that it can do. This might be potentially be higher than it is. We don't know. And there's some further investigation happening in the background with this re farm that research to find out where the nitrogen is coming from. But again, per uh, hectare per round, there can be 10, 20, maybe 30 kilo of nitrogen made available through clover. So on your dairy farm, 20 to 15 kilos with these times of fully irrigating stocking rates, you get crude proteins that are about okay. If you are lower than that, it crashes. If you're above that, you waste. Our farmlets, how do they stack up? 30 kilos, no clover nitrogen needed. Is the clover, the nodules on the clover, are they active? Something for us to investigate, but that's the level we see. So it might not have effective uh, uh, nodules. Pharma 2 and 3 is lower. We need some nitrogen input, and we get to there from clover. So that's where we are about that. But farmlet 4, zero. We have a lower stocking rate. We didn't expect it to grow. Some of the nitrogen is not recycled. It's in silage bales. So it's actually less. Even if I go to this higher level, protein is lower than what we see in the milk. 
So that's where we have a conundrum. Maybe this is 40 and not uh, 25 for the brings in, but that's where James mentioned there's some further research happening to look at. So as you can see, um, 504 is for us a little bit of a conundrum. The stocking rate has to go up. Where we put it at, we don't know yet for next year. Questions? Uh, no, not yet. Uh, you can only do that thoroughly at hindsight so that you know what assumptions to put in. Um, what you have to keep in mind, um, everything is the same at the moment except stocking rate for farmland for any amount of nitrogen going in. So there is uh, a urea fertilizer saving for farmland 2 and 3 and 4. But farmlet 4, probably because we approach it more from a reach and ag perspective, will need some other amendments to keep the soil biology functioning, which will be an extra cost. So it's not necessarily cheaper than farmlet 1. But you can see that there's an optimum, not a maximum, which is probably more reflected in farmlet uh, 2 and 3. So the question is about um, the break-even point that we have and still feeding, uh, we were feeding six kilos of grain. At the moment, we are feeding four. Uh, what we do is we try and get maximum grass in the cows. And we uh, uh, see our cows doing a certain production. That is a certain energy intake. We first fill that with grass and we see them eating probably about 17 kilo dry matter per day on average over a longer period of time. And then the gap we fill with grain, which has been six kilos, and we always leave that six kilos at that level until after mating or the core of mating, or else you have a potential negative impact on conception rates. So the amount of grain that we feed now is driven by the fact that they are doing still 2.4 kilo milk solids. They have to eat 18 kilo grass, which I don't think they can. Uh, dry matter and four kilo of concentrate, and we might about get there and keep conditions stable. But we run the risk, and you see our cows have been challenged on a regular basis. You see that we prioritize a high dry matter intake. The debate is only, could I be eating 18 or so? But you can see there were so many challenges over time as you have, especially uh, until after mating, you wanna, don't want to mess too much with them. The body condition of the cows is at a lower threshold that is seen as ideal threshold over the lactation. So that's why we are at where they are. So they are at a normal trajectory increasing body weight and body condition, not at a high trajectory. But we are testing if we can get slightly more grass in. And it, when we talk about 17 or 17 kilos, it's all season, every day, on average, what you try and get into it, not only under good conditions. Peter, how are we exploring the non dual wax and the efficiency? One of the, uh, James can explain a bit more about that probably, but one of uh, the side projects we have running is a PhD student looking at where the nitrogen can come from within our system. So we are trying to pull that apart more to get more evidence for that. Do you want to add something? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So we are exploring that further to see if we can find the cause of the nitrogen in the system. So the question was, um, we renovated all sort, ripped it up, that dies off and is digested in the soil and that rele re uh, releases nutrients. Would that have been the source of nitrogen? Uh, that's one of the things that we considered too. One of the things we did, however, is, and that is now already uh, longer than three years ago, um, uh, that is when the old sort was ripped up. If I now look at, and that is not here, and uh, Rowan uh, uh, will have uh, much more knowledge of that than I do, but if I look at the Northern Hemisphere, the Nitrogen available from the sort that dies is a huge amount in the first year, somewhat in the second year, and maybe a little bit in the third year. We are after that. There was an annual crop of Italian, that's one year, and maybe a little bit. So, depends on you, if you talk about growing seasons or calendar, uh, over there is growing seasons. Um, so, uh, when this season started, that nitrogen was used up had been become available already, or there might have been a smidgen before Christmas, not now, and it still looks good. So it might still be, but hey, uh, we assume that that's not, uh, that's not truly driving the difference.
Thanks for the opportunity to come and talk today. Um, I am a little bit out of my rainfall zone, um, but there's some uh, common, common things that uh, work across our um, pasture systems, and it's refreshing to see that um, the dairy industry is now looking at legumes. Um, we've been quite focused on them in the low rainfall environment for quite a bit of time, and so um, bringing that knowledge um, that we've got in there across to the high rainfall zone um, is, is really interesting. Um, so I just wanted to talk about how I see our feed bases in Tassie and I'm making some generalisations here and there's obviously a lot of um, different ways that people are managing their farms and, and their grazing. But essentially where I see um, the, ho the high end or the dairy system is that it's high rainfall or irrigated, um, quite intensive. Um, it can be beef as well but um, the, the land value is obviously high. Um, the fertiliser inputs have, have historically been higher than other grazing systems. There's generally higher renovation rates um, being driven by the, um, that, uh, that, that need to get higher, um, higher output um, in terms of our pastures. Um, generally because we're high rainfall and we've got the ability to irrigate, the renova renovation rate is, is higher um, and the, there's a lower risk of, of renovation failure. Um, and our composition generally has been dominated by a couple of species. Um, perennial ryegrass obviously is the grass and, and with you know, reasonably lower rates of, of legumes and herbs, obviously white clover is the big one in our high rainfall zone. Um, you kind of push, push across into a slightly lower rainfall, we, we're moving more into beef systems. Um, we've got the ability to irrigate at, at some times a year but um, quite often not fully irrigated. Um, still probably reasonably high land value, but we're backing off on the inputs. So our fertiliser inputs are a bit less, our renovation late rates are a little bit less, and um, we're, st we're starting to get into a little bit, um, because often it's dry land, we're getting into the um, space where sometimes we get um, renovation failure. Um, and our composition is generally a little bit more weak, mixed, and we see that with uh, probably uh, an increase of weedy um, grass species that tend to tend to come into our, our mixes. We move across into, into sheep, um, we're getting to the medium low rainfall, it becomes a, a more a semi-extensive um, semi grazing system, um, much lower rates of fertiliser um, being put in um, and, and sort of those renovation rates are quite, quite low and, and farmers are willing to accept uh, or, or prolong, those, um, prolong those pastures for a lot longer um, than what, what we would see in the high rainfall zone. And then we get right into our extensive sheep wool grazing systems where our renovation rates are very low uh, and, and risk of renovation failure is high. So, you know, a lot of the time we see farmers being burnt, you know, they, 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 they want to renovate a pasture, they get burnt and I'll wait another five years until a rain event and I might have another go. So um, that's the way I kind of see, the, see our feed base. It's sort of, there's a lot of generalisation there and there's a lot of probably grey in between, but that's the way I see it. Now... Obviously, we're, we're talking about high rainfall here today, but the things that I kind of see that are really important for each of these sort of, um, of, of these feed bases at the moment, um, obviously dairy need to continue to mani manage and, and monitor for high utilisation. There's a lot of financial input going into it. We need to make sure that we're, we're ma maximising that. But as James said, we're looking to try and diversify this feed base a bit and perhaps back off on our, on our nitrogen inputs. Um, and wherever possible, we're trying to cultivate and nurture any bit of remaining biodiversity we've got in, in our native vegetation. I'll, I'll quickly skim through these others because it's, it's not a focus for today, but in, in general, improving our grazing management probably in our, in our beef systems and to a lesser extent in our sheep systems, there's a lot of gain that can be made there in terms of productivity around grazing management and then just bumping up fertility rates. Um, again, probably in that sheep, sheep system there's opportunity to improve our grazing again but improve our renovation rates and get things, get things moving in that direction. And, and, and probably the big opportunity in, in these um, lower rainfall environments is around biodiversity and um, making sure that we're nurturing and, and enhancing any areas of remnant vegetation that we've got because um, they'll help offset some of these intensive areas. Um, one thing that I wanted to highlight was we did a pasture survey in 2022 which was a 10 or 11 year gap 
um, from the period of time that we did it uh, back in 2010-11. And what it's showing is that that northwest um, area of the state is probably our best in terms of our pastures being botanically productive. And what I mean by that is that those pastures are carrying enough, um, um, I guess, productive and exotic species to the, for them to be optimally productive. And we see that the renovation rates are kind of driving that in the northwest. So you see those dark green dots in the, in the circular head, King Island region, they are, they are our best pastures in the state. When you go further east and into those lighter coloured dots, we start to see big proportions of weedy grasses coming in. And although they are productive at certain times of the year, they are holding back our productivity. Okay, so those, uh, and, and you notice that it probably follows pretty neatly with a rainfall gradient. Um, but the thing I want to emphasise is there's plenty of good pastures in those East Coast and Midlands areas, and so rainfall should not be an excuse for, for, for bad pastures. Focus on legumes for a moment. There aren't a lot of perennial legumes available. Um, generally, there's not a lot of choice that we've got, but in, when we look at our high rainfall zone, we're probably restricted to red clover, white clover and strawberry clover, and we see that being picked up in our... Um, in our farmlet study out here, but there's a couple of others, in including the trefoil, that um, has potential and has some other benefits in terms of perhaps mitigating um, methane, but it comes at a cost. So I guess what, you know, above that 700 mil rainfall, we're in a sweet spot, obviously, for white clover, but there are other options that we can diversify the legume. This is some work that an honours student did with on, on a, on a um, pasture legume evaluation that we had at Cressy. He dug, dug up um, some of our legume plots and um, took measurements of the root structure the de uh, to a depth of 50 centimetres. And from those measurements, he was able to draw and depict what that root structure looks like. So this is a shallow, reasonably shallow duplex, quite common through the Midlands. The standout things that you can see is that where there was white clover and Quite a, quite a lot of the plants had already gone by this stage because it's, it's on the edge of, of persistence for white clover. Those roots are only operating in that top um, sort of 10 to 20 centimetres. So once we get a drawing of that soil profile, white clover is just not able to access moisture and white clover tends to be a bit of a kamikaze plant. It'll grow and grow and grow until it runs out of moisture and then it dies, okay? On the other hand, you go to the other end of the scale, lucerne's got a deep taproot, it's able to access moisture for a lot longer in the season, and it's got the ability then, when it does get too dry, it'll go into more, a more dormant state. It will drop its leaves, it's got the ability to adapt to those dry conditions. White clover doesn't. The interesting bits in between are that the red clover and the strawberry clover have got that primary taproot that goes a little bit deeper, um, and so adding those into even um, the dry land mixes at the high rainfall zone, you will see better production of those later in the season than what you will white clover. One of the bits of research that we've been focusing on in our large um, legume project that we're, we've collaborated with MLA on is looking at waterlogging. Um, and that's obviously quite prominent. The dairy industry, particularly in the circuit head area, um, not a lot of slope, we've got hump and hollow type um, uh, aspects trying to, trying to improve drainage, but often we've still got large periods of land that are sitting um, wet for a certain amount of the year. So um, it can kind of look like this, and our old mate, strawberry clover, is the best um, for, for being able to deal with this waterlogging. So it's able to, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll work through some of our research here. So. This is, this is some work that we did in, initially. Um, on the left-hand side of each of these pairs is the control plant, and then on the right-hand side is a waterlogged plant. So you can see just the significant impact that in each of these cases, for each of these species, that waterlogging has as an effect. It not only, in these cases, it not only affects the above-ground dry matter, but it also affects the roots. Okay, that's quite obvious in each of those. Now, these are all pairs of strawberry clover. And so this is the main cultivar that's available, Palestine in the middle here. On the left hand side we've got the um, control plant and again on the right hand side you've got a waterlogged plant. And generally there's not nearly, this, not nearly such a difference between the control and the waterlogged plant. You can see that pretty clearly there. All of these other pairs are just different genotypes of strawberry clover and so 
you can see um, across those, they're all showing pretty good tolerance to waterlogging. So strawberry clover is a plant, and I think there's some pots going around. Some people might get a little bit confused with strawberry clover and red clover because of the, the colour of that plant, but essentially... Essentially what we've got is a quite prostrate growing plant, and they grow out, it grows out from that initial... Um, initial primary root with these stolons and they creep across the ground. Anywhere where we start to get um, enough moisture at the surface on each of these nodes along these stolons, it will start to take root. Okay, and so you can see this daughter, effectively a daughter plant, just starting along that stolon and sending a root down. Now, what that, that is really enhanced when we've got periods of waterlogging. Okay? So... Uh, the other, why, why it's called strawberry clover is, is partly because of those stolons. It looks out like how a strawberry would, um, would operate and then set down those daughter plants. But also when you look at the flowers um, of these um, and, and, the, and the seed ball, you know, it looks like a strawberry. So there's clear differences. So you can see once we start getting a period of waterlogging, we start to see that primary root or those deeper roots start to pair back. So that water, that water will start to um, have a detrimental effect on those deeper roots. But what we see with those above ground stolons that run across the surface, we see a change. So we, in, the, in the waterlogging event, we'll see this adventitious rooting or this daughter rooting along that stolon and it's shifting it, it's shifting its um, roots to the surface where there's actually more oxygen, more gas exchange available. And so that's its major adaptation. That's why it, this ability isn't seen in the other legume species. So it's quite different. The other thing that we see in its ability to adapt is that it forms arenchyma. So effectively it's opening up the root, opening up the centre of the roots into big straws and allowing gas exchange to come from um, up in the top part of the plant, down into the roots, so that all the processes in that root can continue to function. Now, Adam Langworthy has only just recently left us, uh, and myself and a few other re researchers and tech staff have been working on strawberry clover and uh, trying to understand whether this waterlogging trait is consistent across all of the, water all of the strawberry clover germplasm. And so this map sort of showing all the... Um, all the uh, areas across um, Europe, northern Africa and out into, or up into Scandinavia and out into China where um, strawberry clover germplasm has been collected. It's got quite a wide natural range. Um, and so we wanted to um, bring together germplasm for, from all those different ranges and see whether or not um, those, all that germplasm has the ability to be waterlogging tolerant. Um, and th this is how we set that up in, in big, um, in, in, in these similar type pots. Uh, and, and enforce a waterlogging event. What we've found is, right, pretty much right the way across that or, um, 40 odd uh, accessions of, or different ger uh, genetic material that we, we looked at, there's no, not really a significant um, effect of waterlogging on shoot weight. Okay, so it, that, that um, waterlogging tolerance trait seems to be very consistent across the whole species. Where we do see it having, it does uh, have an effect on, on, um, on root weight, and we expected that. So we do see a pairing in the root weight, but it's still being able to function above the ground. Uh, and like I said, that arenchyma formation starts to increase under waterlogged conditions. What, what the implication of that is, is that we should be able to follow um, traditional breeding practices, incorporating perhaps some germplasm from other areas in the world, into the current germplasm and do that without the risk of losing waterlogging tolerance. We, we want to try and increase productivity of strawberry clover because in general it's less productive than white clover, but we want to do that without losing its waterlogging tolerance and that's quite important. Um, so I guess what I'm saying is this strawberry clover is quite a flexible plant. It's been underutilised, I believe, in our farming systems. It's got the ability to be um, to be able to survive in dry, in dry um, environments. I've s seen patches that have been in the Midlands in 
you know, hollows, but albeit they've been there for 40 years and it's been able to continue to grow in the Midlands under harsh conditions. Um, but it's when good conditions come, it's able to spread and recolonate areas in the pasture. And I think that's really important. Um, and then obviously adapt to waterlogging conditions. So you kind of got this all-round plant. Normally we'd say, okay, if something's drought tolerant, it's probably not going to be waterlogging tolerant at the same time. All those, but all bad, they've been there for 40 years and it's been able to continue to grow in the Midlands under harsh conditions. Um, but it's when good conditions come, it's able to spread and recolonate areas in the pasture. I think that's really important. Um, and then obviously adapt to waterlogging conditions. So you kind of got this all-round plant. Normally we'd say, okay, if something's drought tolerant, it's probably not going to be waterlogging tolerant at the same time, but we probably have that in this plan. Um, just a couple of uh, follow-up uh, things for producers about just legumes in general. Uh, if we want to improve, in, enhance the legume composition, we need to make sure that our pHs are up. Um, I think there's, like I say, the ability to sow multiple legume species rather than just one. Um, potassium and, and um, phosphorus are critically important for, and some of the microbes. When we are sowing legumes that uh, the seed is freshly inoculated, often, um, and that, that, that coating is fresh, uh, if we leave, uh, if the seed has been in the warehouse for too long or it's been on the back of the ute, the rise up, it will die. It is a living organism and it's sensitive. Um, but the main two ways that we can manipulate it in the paddock off on the nitrogen and grazing to or, or grazing before it reaches a, a high um, high amount of dry matter and we see if, if um, particularly in dairies I've seen it where they're going in it at 2500 we see the canopy a lot more open we do see more legume come in the pasture obviously that comes at a cost but that's the general um, management thing that we can we can do to enhance it I'll just fi finally, and so I've only spoken about a little bit of our research today, but finally we've got a new project called Pasture 365 that we're collaborating with Deakin University on and it's going to be looking at, um, it's through the Future Drought Fund long term trials, we're looking at um, far more, um, I guess, uh, pa pasture diversity, looking at, at constructing mixes uh, and looking at how they, how um, very similar to the, to the farmlet study in how um, binary mixes or, or, or sort of three to four um, species mixes um, compared to multi-species, so 10, 15 species in particular. So we're doing that uh, at a medium rainfall site in the northeast and one in the Midlands um, and they'll be, they'll be uh, a long-term trial. So we've got time to be able to monitor those effects of, uh, of um, potentially some uh, species dominating and some dropping out over time. So that's um, what, where, where we're heading to try and build resilience in our dryland system. We have a, uh, a graduate diploma in agribusiness where we have a specialisation in dairy and also in horticulture uh, at this point in time. And so this graduate diploma of agribusiness, it's, it's um, eight units um, as, as a structure um, running over a number of years. Um, and the way that that unit or well, that particular course is set up is that there's a, uh, an introductory unit on dairy business management and then there is a final unit on the development and strategy uh, which is very much a, a business plan, so the completion of a business plan, so requiring all the knowledge from the rest of it and so they're the first and the last of the units. All the units in the middle can be done in any order as part of the, um, the course that, that is being run and so there's innovation and entrepreneurship, leadership, people and culture, dairy supply chain management, um, dairy farm systems, global trends, new market opportunities and, and financial management. And so that's the, the offering of the Graduate Diploma of Agribusiness in its current structure. Um, typically, the, the students that are doing this, this course, it's been running for a number of years now, um, in the age bracket of about 30 to 50. Previous qualification, it does vary, but generally speaking, um, a bachelor's degree or a certain amount of experience, so five plus years experience in farming business and um, supervisory or managerial experience. It is very much aimed at those who are at the, uh, the higher end of the, their management you know, within dairy to be able to give them the skills to be able to operate those businesses at a, at a high level. Um, at the, the way that the, the course is currently operating, so there's eight units that are, that are, are functioning there for the graduate diploma, but we also are providing a graduate certificate in agribusiness 
after the completion of four units. So you can complete four units, and then once you've completed those, you can exit and get a graduate um, certificate in agribusiness, or you, and then you can add other on later. So there is the ability to be able to exit after four units um, from this. Uh, there's also the development of some short courses. So we've been working with Dairy Australia, particularly around the, the HR, so the human resources <laughs> side of things, and we've developed three short courses um, and they'll be delivered for the first time this year to dairy farmers uh, in particular and working closely with Dairy Australia. And if you complete those and their assessments for each of those three, they will then qualify to be um, a, a unit within the um, graduate diploma. And so you can kind of you know, start off with your short courses, um, complete one unit of HR in total, that then um, goes towards the graduate certificate and then you can complete those and then you can go on to the graduate diploma. And there is at the moment some work done around the potential for a master's as well where we add um, further units on that to be able to go right through. So it's, it's kind of, it's what we call a stacking process where you can start off with, with, um, with your short courses and then build up to your graduate certificate and then through to the, the graduate diploma. There are also some workshops that we offer Offer, but that's more around really an introduction to it to see whether people really want to, to be involved in it. And so we've done a number of those single topic um, workshops as well. Um, but the idea is, is that we want to we want to try and get people to you know, get their qualifications and, and to be able to be flexible enough to be able to fit across um, a variety of different people uh, and, and their needs. Um, so that's just very quickly. Um, some information about the, the agribusiness degree. At the moment, as I said, it's, there's a specialisation in dairy and a specialisation in horticulture. Um, and we are looking to potentially bring a bit more of a specialisation on the beef side of things as well. If you want some more details about that, then you can speak to, to Sandy, so you can contact him um, directly. Um, there, all, there is also, I think, in the packs, is there all information? Is there some information on the table? There's some information about it which you can use to take away. Um, sorry, I probably can't present that as well as Sandy because I don't do the course, but there you go. Great to see you all and thanks for turning up today. I, I love talking about virtual herding and virtual fencing because it's one of those areas, um, like many at the farm here, where we're really leading the nation and all the work that's been going on here at the farm but also out in the commercial environment um, is cutting edge stuff. So it's really exciting to always see what's happening and to spread our knowledge about what we found out here into the broader commercial world as well. So many of you may already know, but for those who don't, virtual fencing is a technology that's used to manage and control the movement of cattle using sensory cues rather than you know, a, a physical fence or an electric fence. So how the technology works is that you can set a fence line using a GPS. Now that GPS location is uh, communicated to a collar that each animal wears. And as the cattle approach this GPS location, the collar gives it a warning cue, which is normally an audio signal. If she ignores that signal and crosses over the virtual fence line, then the collar delivers a short, sharp electric pulse. But if she stops moving on the audio cue, she turns around on the audio cue, she gets no electric pulse. So over um, repeat interactions of the cue followed by a pulse, the animals learn pretty quickly to stop moving when they hear the cue and they increasingly respond to the cue alone. And what I think is really neat about the technology is that it actually capitalises on a very normal common um, way that we all learn, it's called operant conditioning, which is a fancy way of saying learning by consequence. So a really good way to demonstrate what this means is if you think about when you're teaching your dog how to sit. You tell it to sit, it doesn't know what that word means. So you push its bum down and you give it a treat. The treat is the reward, it's the consequence of the behaviour. Over time it learns to sit when it says, when you say sit, and expect a reward in return. So it starts to respond to your cue alone. It's the same thing that we see with virtual fencing, but a little bit of a tweak. The cows learn that that warning cue, the cue that we're giving it, which is the audio, means stop moving. And that way it can avoid electric pulse. It gives the control back into the animal in terms of whether it receives a pulse or not. I've got a video here of a, a cow grazing with an older kind of uh, technology called the e-shepherd. 
And I'm going to see if it works. I don't know if there's audio on this, but you can hear the, um, the audio signal uh, if the video is working properly. And then, whoop. no audio. That's okay. You'll be able to see the moment where she gets her cue. And she's, she's actually quite a reactive animal. Um, often they just turn and keep grazing. But it works really effectively. Now, most of our work at the moment is with a tech company called Halter. We've been playing in the virtual fencing space for nearly a decade now, but at the moment we are working with Halter for a number of reasons. Now, the first of those is that Halter has been designed with the dairy cow in mind, and some of the previous products we've worked with have been more designed for, say, large cattle farms and extensive beef. Um, and we found that when we took those and tried to fit them into our systems where our animals are quite different and our management is quite different, it didn't always work in the same way. We also like Halter because it can fence animals like the other products can, but it has this additional feature which is herding animals. So it can move them um, from a paddock to the dairy, for example. Uh, Halter has an individualised cue, so they've got this really clever way of uh, finding the minimum threshold for an individual animal. And this takes out some of the variability in how animals respond to the technology because they're finding the right response for the right animal. And it has additional features. So it has like ways uh, to help you manage pasture and allocate pasture and reproduction as well. So if you think about all of that, I think that it's, it's kind of clear why people are interested in the technology and what it can provide uh, producers and the sorts of things it can bring to your farming system. But the other side of this is what is it like for the animals? And one of the important things about answering this question is that in today's society, with any new technology or management system, we are required to demonstrate that we are at least not a negatively affecting welfare. Hopefully we can improve it, but at the bare minimum, um, don't negatively affect it. So working with Halter last year, we ran a trial to look at this specific question. Now, in this uh, trial, we had four groups of cows. Now, there were 40 cows in each group. Two of these groups were managed, we called it conventional. So this is with electric fencing. It was going out and measuring the pasture and allocating. And you can see a little excerpt from one of my lab books there, of some of the calculations I've done to allocate the right amount of pasture for a group. Um, it involves sitting behind cows, pushing them to the dairy for hours each day, and for um, a rookie like me, spending probably the same number of hours digging myself out of paddocks that I repeatedly thought, this time I won't get bogged. Um, now compare that, we had another two groups that we managed with the Halter Tech. So these animals underwent a 10-day training period to the technology, and then we observed how we managed these animals or how they performed when we managed them over an additional four weeks. So overall, the trials went for about six weeks. And I've got a little picture, which is I likened that little cat to me after I was managing with halter and allocating pasture compared to um, being out there running out fences. And there's a little example there of my rotation, or uh, um, my grazing in the paddock compared to my um, sketch in my lab book. Now, firstly, um, we found the technology, if we're, I'm going to split this up. So I'm going to first talk about what happened when we were virtually fencing them. So that's when they were in a paddock being grazed. And then after that, I'll talk about what happened when we were herding them. And I'm doing this because most of the other products out there only use fencing. So, you know, to be a bit more of a comparison like for like. And we found the tech works really well at keeping cows off fresh pasture in a paddock. So um, you can see some graze lines there. And I think we had something like 90% of our cows spent less than 1.7 minutes over the virtual fence line. So pretty much all our cows stayed behind the virtual fence line. Um, we also found that they learnt really, really quickly to respond to the technology in this scenario. So um, I think, I say with, within 24 hours, but I think you could even say there was evidence within eight hours that they were responding to the audio more and more. So in the first eight hours of the tech, about 70% of their interactions resulted in a pulse. After that eight hours, still on the first day, it was more like 25%. 
Now, what we have here is some of the, um, some of the data. So on the left-hand side, we ask the question, how many cows learnt to avoid a pulse altogether? And this was our first question. I'm going, I'm, I'm going to do a walkabout. What we have here, so these are the animals that received zero pulses. This is the time. Training, week one, two, three and four. So what this is saying is that during training, most animals received a pulse. About 5% didn't. As we go on over time, it goes up to 30% of animals not receiving a pulse. And by the last week, week four, half the animals received zero pulses at all during that entire week. We then ask the question, well, what about those animals that do receive a pulse? How many are they getting? And that's what this is looking at. So these are our two groups. We have a blue and a green group. This is day one. I don't have day one over here because every animal receives a pulse while they're learning and it must messed up our models. Um, so day one, we had between eight and 13 pulses per day. Well, they're learning, so that makes sense. They have to pair the association. They haven't learned to respond to that audio. But look, the rest of the training period, that dives straight down. This grey dotted line here is one pulse per day. So over the rest of this time, it ended up less than one pulse per day for the, each animal. Or another way of looking at it, um, I think it was about one pulse per 100 interactions. Now, by comparison, some of the other technologies out there report numbers more like 15 to 20%. So this is a really promising finding. Okay, so that is the virtual fencing. Well, what about the virtual herding component? Now, this is a much more complex behaviour that we're asking the animals to learn. So, and this is also, it's a really novel new thing. There aren't any other technologies that I'm aware of. Yeah, thank you. Um, that have this capability. Now, these animals are on day four of their training. You can see this is early in the morning. Um, some of them are wondering what I'm doing, but they're also pretty used to me and they're just... Can you pick the moment they get the cue to move? Four days it took them to learn to do that without intervention. I was um, shocked really. I was expecting it to be much longer. It was amazing. And I love how calm it is. They just wander off. Um, the other cool thing about the virtual herding uh, is... Oh, sorry. It works by incorporating a third cue called a, vi a vibration cue. So it works the same way as, say, virtual fencing, it has the audio, it has the pulse if the animals don't listen to the audio to kind of direct their movement, so go left or right. And then it has the vibration cue which keeps them moving along. So if they stop moving, the collar starts to vibrate and the intensity of that vibration increases over a 30 second period. If she's still not moving, then after that period it'll give her a pulse. But it gives the animal enough time to stop, have a break, go to the toilet, catch her breath, any of that, as long as she keeps moving forward. The other good thing is it doesn't dictate pace or speed. So they can all move at their own pace as long as they're moving forward. Now again, we asked the same questions with this as we did with the virtual fencing component. So how many animals learn to get no pulses at all? And that's what we're looking at on the left. And typically, no animals avoid a pulse during training. That's normal and we would expect that. But by week four, 40% of cows were receiving zero pulses at all during training. And what I love about this, it makes me kind of wish that we kept on going with this experiment. Because look how it's going up, 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 up. What, I wonder what happens with that over the months that come. Does it keep going up? The second question we have is um, how many of those animals that did receive a pulse, how many were they getting? During training, it's about one and a half pulses per day. And this goes down to, I think it's 0.25 pulses per day on average. So this is one pulse every four transitions. It's another way of looking at it. Oops. 
So that gives us a, a, you know, an overview of what's happening to the cows, but it doesn't really tell us what the cows think of this. Um, and one of the really great things about working in dairy is that you guys collect so much data all the time. And production data gives us a really clear snapshot into how these animals are coping. That's because animals that are stressed, that are not coping well, don't produce as well as animals that do. They don't grow as well, they don't put on as much weight. So we can look at these things um, to determine how the animals are coping. So this is their milk. The blue is the virtual fence cattle. The pink is the electric fence cattle. And we saw no difference in their milk production. This variation is, um, this dive here is when I cut out silage for a little while because uh, it's some pasture rotation stuff. And then I put them back on here. On the left here, you're looking at body condition, no difference there. We're looking at weight here, no differences there either. So no red flags in our production data. When we look at behaviour, this is rumination. There was no difference in how the animals were ruminating between our electric fence and our virtual fence groups. But this is grazing. And this is a bit interesting because we are seeing a bit of a consistent effect here with electric fence animals spending about 20 minutes per day grazing than our virtual fence animals. And what's really interesting about this is this is the same thing that we found in a different product many years ago and the same thing that's been reported overseas. So it seems something to do with the grazing strategies perhaps of cattle when they are managed with virtual fence compared to electric fence. And I even suspect is it something to do with how they graze under the fence um, with an electric fence and, and a virtual fence doesn't enable that. But we need to look into that. I think the important thing is that we see no differences in their other production variables. It's 20 minutes per day. So I think it's kind of negligible, but it would be interesting to see what, what's going on. Now, we also took a whole heap of um, phys measures of physiological stress. So we've got over 2,500 samples of, individual, of cow milk and we can analyse these for how stressed cows are. When you're stressed, you release a hormone called cortisol, and that goes through into the milk. We're in the process of measuring these. It's the final piece of our puzzle, um, and there are lots of people hanging on this data, including me, and as soon as I have it, I will share that data. But what's next for virtual fencing? Well, we're really interested in, um, in extending our understanding of virtual fence into a more applied or commercial setting and to think kind of out of the box. So how can it be used to improve the productivity and sustainability, environmental management of our farms? And I've got some examples here. So could we use virtual fencing uh, to fence off waterways from cattle and improve water quality? There are programs in Tasmania where we are um, helping to support farmers to do this sort of work with structural fences. And I wonder if virtual fencing could do it overnight. Um, what kind of pressure does Halter take off farmers by removing mundane tasks like um, putting up fences, by sitting behind cows? Can you redirect that effort to more high value tasks? And does that then help maybe attract and retain the next generation of farmers or farm workers into our systems? And we know that younger generations do to tend to have a different expectation of the workforce. There may also be benefits uh, for, for animal health and welfare that we haven't captured in our study. And these need more longer term studies with more animals in them. Um, so for example, cows can work at, walk at their own pace. What does that mean for reducing lameness? or um, the technology includes all these continuous monitoring of cow behaviour and health and gives you a history of the individual animal. So it allows you to manage an individual and monitor an individual much more closely. Uh, the, do we end up with differences in how they're nutritionally managed and what impact does that have on reproduction, particularly if we're looking at the transition period? So I'm going to end today um, 
before questions, with a, with a bit of a call out on that note, because we do currently have a, a project that's been funded by um, the state government where we are trying to quantify and explore what these impacts are and what they mean in a commercial setting. So for those that may have Halter, that may be looking at Halter, I guess we're, we're interested in what your experience is, if there's something that you think you've seen on your farm um, that you would like to explore more in a, with a research project, um, that you would like to quantify, that you maybe have thought of a completely new way of managing the technology. If there's any way that we can work with you and support you, I think the main thing is that we're very interested in doing this in commercial ways as well as whatever ways that we can support in the research setting of this farm. So if that sounds like something that, you know, you have some questions about Halter and that we can help by collecting data and give that back to you, then please feel free to reach out to me um, or about anything Halter related or otherwise, just I'm, I'm very contactable. So thank you and I'd love to answer questions. I was wondering what sort of stock densities you're about able to achieve. With the, with the fencing, please. Yeah, good question. Um, I think that there are, there is a limit with, in terms of increasing your stocking density. Um, and I know that Holter have built in a warning when you, I don't know what the limit is, but once you get over a certain point, you can make it too tight and too hard for the animals to turn around and respond to the cues effectively. So there's a point beyond which, um, yes, the technology may enable you to move animals, say, seven times a day, but it is actually counterproductive because of the stress and the competitive environment that that sort of thing creates. So um, at the moment, I think mostly is still two or three times a day shifts, but... Um, you don't have to be out there doing it. That's the sort of thing that we would love to look at, though. Can I make one more comment on that? Just, I just had a thought. Because I, I, I often wonder if there's some sort of interaction in there in how much pasture we're giving them and what time of day. So we know that things like the carbohydrate level in the pasture can increase at night. So do we give them more pasture access at night, where they're ready for a big grazing bout, do they eat more then? Um, and then do we, can we have an impact on productivity? So I think it's probably more about the interaction between how much pasture you make available, what time you make it available, and a lot of these things where we've normally been feeding cows based on what works for us, in terms of we don't want to be up at 4 a.m. shifting cows before milking, but Halter could enable that sort of thing. I don't know of anyone in the commercial environment who's doing that, but I would love to look at that. Yeah, so what I want to do is just provide a quick overview of the Dairy Farm Monitor project. Um, it's a big chunk of our work um, within the extension team. Um, we currently, um, we've been participating or involved in this, in, the, in dairy benchmarking for around 30 years. So, um, and over the last 10 years, more recently, um, we participate in the national benchmarking program. So we collect a lot of data. Um, there's around 30 farms. And, yep. And within the benchmarking program, we, we, we measure the physical and financial performance of those dairy farms. So um, I'd like to thank all those farms for participating um, it, it is a big job. We've got a small window. We start collecting around the, the 1st of June and we lie our deadlines around the 30th of, of, of October. So we try to cram a lot in. Um, and the information that we collect is really important. It's important for the farm, not only for the farmers, but for industry. Um, we're able to provide reports back to the farmer for um, just individual farm analysis. Um, but also for industry to compare state by state, but also provide a, a report back to industry. So you're able to, we're able to track the trends, physical trends, um, performance trends, and also those financial trends. And in terms of financial trends, um, it puts some of those 
the costs and the performance of dairy farm costs into context. Um, and more importantly, we try to track milk price um, and cost of production. So within cost of production, we've got variable and overhead costs. And as you can see, it lets us look at what's happened over time. Not only what's happened in, that, in the last financial year, which was 22-23, but it looks at, we're able to look back at where we've come from um, to where we are now. Um, and as you can see, so like for 22-23, we're at a $9.88 milk price. It was a fantastic year. Um, but more importantly, if you look at cost of production, um, which is here, it was, it's gone from $5.06 back in 13-14 to $6.94. So the cost of production, there is a cost price, there is a cost creep, which we notice, and that's why the information that we collect and the participation from dairy farmers who provide that information is really, really valuable. Um, without that, um, we don't know how we're going. So if you can't measure it, you can't manage it, as they say. When you look at milk price and cost change over 10 years, um, you know, milk price has gone from $6.87 to $9.88. There's been a change of 43.8% over that period, which is a 4.4% change per year. And the same for variable and overhead costs. You can see how we've tracked it. The change has been huge. Um, it needs to be put into context, but it's really important information. Um, and as far as cost of production goes, which is critical in terms of running a profitable business, um, you can see how those costs are trending. Um, and just to put it into further context, I looked at um, what the average inflation rate's been over those last 10 years. It's increased to 2.3% from 2% to around 2.3% on the back of the 22 um, back of the 22 year where inflation's, we've seen inc inflation creep to around 6.6%. So that's sort of t thrown a few of those trends or, a f or some of those, um, I mean it was, a, it was a huge year for inflation, we're still seeing in inflation creep, but what it's done is increased the average inflation rate. But when you compare it to the change per year, you can see variable overhead cost of production is all increasing over and above the average inflation rate. Um, but fortunately, milk price is also increasing, so it tends to put some of that into context, but we need to, to look deeper into the detail. What's in cost of production? Um, for those who are not familiar, we've got variable costs make up 64% of cost of production. So that includes herd, shed and feed costs. Feed, feed costs are the major one there in terms of cost of production, um, um, running at 56%. And in terms of overheads, uh, they're cash overheads um, and non-cash overheads, which include depreciation and non-imputed labour. Um, and total overheads around 36% of the total cost of production. So some of these things we can control, other things, well everything we can control, some things we can't, for example rates and um, some of those costs like farm insurance which we don't seem to have much control of at all. But um, um, So when we measure uh, in the dairy farm monitor program, we, uh, the physical and financial performance gives us an indication, a measure of, we're able to measure profit, which is EBIT, so earnings before interest and tax, and then that's before interest. So we also look at return on total assets managed. Um, so last year, for the 22-23 year, the return on total assets managed was 10.3%. Yep, so on the back of a higher milk price. Uh, the year before that, uh, milk price was $7.48, return on total assets, whether it's a coincidence or not, and like I say, you need to look further and in, deeper into the detail, return on total assets was 5.3% measured across those 30 farms. Um, and I guess to put that into context, those 30 farms are only about 8% of the industry. So, like, while we endeavour to get as many farms as we can. I mean, 30 is about all we can capture, yeah. Um, just looking at 
some of those major cost categories. Um, um, and it's important to recognise that those major costs make up a lot of these, a lot of the cost of production. Fertiliser is a big one. Um, it's it's, a, it's one of those essential costs that we can't avoid. Um, there are other farm systems. It's all farm systems dependent in terms of how much fertiliser we use. But you can see there has been an increase there. Irrigation costs has come back, and I reckon that's on the back of better irrigation systems, more efficient. Um, centre pivots, lower cost, uh, lower and uh, lower running costs. Um, fodder purchases have also increased and grain and concentrates. Adjustment's a big one. So how much time have I got, Leslie? Right. <laughs> and paid labour. As you can see, there's a lot of information in this stuff um, and we go to a lot of trouble to collect it. Um, in terms of the physical performance indicators, I thought I was ahead of time, I was going to make the most of this. Um, some of those physical trends include cows milked, milk solids per hectare, milk solids per cow and stocking rate. And I'm really interested to look at, this is what we see from some of the larger farms. Um, this is what we see in industry. When we, um, having heard from Peter, uh, they're aiming for 2,000 kilos of milk solids per hectare. The industry's average around 13.65. It's pretty, pretty steady state at the moment. Um, and then in terms of whole grain feed, um, you know, there's some big targets for f um, in the farm trial here. Um, but what we're seeing in industry, um, when we look at uh, feed grazed, pasture conserved, um, there hasn't been a lot of change. And I reckon there's a real opportunity. There's a real opportunity around our feed base and how much more we can grow and harvest. So if you go back, Third, um, to the 13-14 season, we sort of around 9.8 tonne. It's been a bit of a roller coaster, but we haven't moved far off the 10 tonne line and we're sitting around 10.3 tonne for last season. Um, I reckon we can grow and utilise a lot more feed. Um, and, but on the positive, you know, our, our use of nitrogen's around the benchmark of where we need to be set by some of those other countries. So it's sitting around 200 kilos of N per hectare, per effective milking hectare. So we're doing pretty well. Um, and that's just a quick snapshot of so much detail and so many numbers that you wouldn't believe. But I'd like to give a big shout out to the farmers who participate. So first of all, uh, the Task Farm Innovation Hub is funded through the Future Drought Fund and there's eight hubs across regional Australia. The aims of the hub are to increase the climate resilience that already exists in the agriculture systems. Uh, we are hosted by the university and we sit under TIA. Uh, we have also partnered with industry to deliver and design some projects on ground. An example was the multi-species project that took place in Greenham's farm, and there are other projects that I'm more than happy to run you through after this, um, if we've got time. Um, and we pretty much have a set of activities, including workshops and enabling other people to share knowledge that are part of the two programs that we are in charge of, which is drought resilience and ag innovation. So the ag tech guide was actually the, uh, de developed through the ag innovation program. So um, how did we land it in a technology guide for Tasmania after mapping 80 plus opportunities of things that we could do around the innovation world, which is very big. Uh, and through consultation, we prioritized cer certain themes. And certainly the biggest priority was to collate and understand how Tasmanian farmers could benefit from technology and how were they actually already using technology in their enterprises. So pretty much, first of all, we needed to understand what were the challenges for the farmers in their industries. And we only focused in four industries, the veggie, the fruit, the livestock, and the dairy. And once we interviewed farmers and we understood the challenge, we also, with their help, understood what was the technology that was being used to address this challenge, or not. Um, and so this guide contains more than 80% of technology that is present in Tasmania, that is being used by other farmers, and that has the support available 
for you in case you really want to go into this technology. And I'm going to come back to this in a minute, but um, one of the favorite parts for me about this guide is that we also, through conversations, learned that there is a process for farmers and for us when we're giving advice on adopting a piece of technology. And these are some of the considerations that we put on the guide of things that are a good idea to consider before adopting a piece of technology. So during these conversations, as I said before, we found some highlighted challenges in the supply chain by the different industries. Um, and we also find some shared challenges among, amongst the different industries, and you can find all of this in the guide. But for dairy, then we were able to take the two most common challenges, of course these are not all the challenges, but the most common challenges, and place them in the supply chain that was mentioned during the interviews and sort of like sense checked by the work that Beanstalk, who developed the guide with us, works on. Um, but what I, what I think is very important to highlight from the guide is as you flick through it, you're going to see the supply chain that we used for the dairy industry. And we took those challenges, placed them in the supply chain, and also understood what is the technology that those farmers were using or are using to address those challenges in the step of the supply chain. Um, so you can find this for all the industries that I spoke about, um, but the other good thing about the guide is that we acknowledge there's not enough room to put all the pieces of technology that can be used for a particular challenge. So we also have provided all the resources where you can expand on other technology. And lastly, uh, for all of the industries, uh, we have done a case study of a particular farmer that has adopted a piece of technology. And for the dairy farmer, we showcase Duncan McDonald, some of you might, might have heard of him, um, and the halter technology. What is important here and what I want to highlight is the motivations and the drivers for Duncan adopting this technology may be different uh, for different people. Uh, and this is why showcasing one case study does not mean that this is the right technology for you. And we also acknowledge that in the guide, by showing you the traditional journey and the tech enabled journey, that's the way we're calling them, to give you an example of how the supply chain looks without technology and with technology, without implying that one is better than the other one. Um, and that's that. The other thing I wanted to mention is there is a glossary of terms at the end of the of the ACTEC, and the reason why we included this is because there's a lot of terms that are very complex and difficult to understand, and we also acknowledge that this is just the tip of the iceberg when we talk about technology and, and innovation, and we also want to understand what are the barriers and the skills needed to actually use this technology further. So um, there's going to be, uh, there's a project that we have started on digital liter literacy and skills, and I couldn't bring the flyer, unfortunately, but there's going to be a conversation happening in Smithton and other regions of Tasmania where we're just going to sit down and talk about digital and farming and understand what are the challenges and the support that we need because we just uh, we, we have to collate the technology but also be able to, to use it. Um, so that's for me. Come and see me if you've got any questions about the hub or if you have questions, I'm more than happy to answer them, answer them, them now as, much, as best as I can. So we just wanted to have a chat today about what's the future, what's the future of pasture-based dairy farming. But I'm going to start off by asking each of the panellists to um, introduce themselves and just how they're involved in the, in the Tasmanian dairy industry. So Deb, you've got a microphone, would you like to start? It's working? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Um, I'm Deb Morris. I've been in the industry over 40 years. I started off on a dairy farm and uh, went share farming and uh, worked at uh, Ashgrove, worked for the government, worked for Fonterra, and now I'm the regional manager of um, Dairy Taz. And uh, yeah, so I've been around a while. Very much pasture-based um, farming when we were farming and I did that yep. for 22 years. Yep, wonderful. Fran? Hi everyone. Um, myself and my husband Bert, we are uh, dairy farming in Marawal. Um, and we have a few beef and we pasture base there. Um, and we came here from England um, and we knew nothing about grass. We thought it was bedding. We did definitely didn't eat it. And then we came here and we discovered this amazing thing. Um, 
And so we love it and we, we try and eat as much as we can uh, with our cows. Um, and then in the day, most days, I work for Prime Value and um, we have 7,300 cows and I'm a junior operations manager. And my main job is to keep feed in front for those uh, farms and work with the managers. Uh, background is uh, when I was a lot skinnier and had more hair, I was a student here back in 1996 or 97 and since then had a passion for working in the dairy industry, um, mostly around pastures. Um, my role at the moment, I have a joint role, I'm academic lead for TIA and also R&D lead for sustainability with Fonterra. Yeah, John Wilson, um, I'm a uh, director of BWB Management, which is a management group that uh, uh, basically look after, at the moment, seven farms, about 6,500 cows, on behalf of uh, uh, investors that are uh, basically in an equity partnership model. Um, also involved as a part owner of a dairy farm on the West Tamar, um, milking about 700 cows there, and currently uh, managing a farm at Wilmont, um, about 770 cows there we, in this last 12 months we've been development on that farm. So. A dairy farm with, I think, with one of the best views in Tasmania. <laughs> it's a beautiful place. Um, Maribor is pretty special too. <laughs> so um, I want to start with you, John and Fran, just to, can you just um, tell us a little bit more about how important um, pasture is in your businesses? So, John, you've still got the microphone. Yeah, well, Leslie, you get to my age, you can't remember too much, so you've got to write notes. That, yeah. That's quite okay. I opened them up here and I realised I haven't got my glasses, so... <laughs> 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 but anyway, um, yeah, pastures, it's one of the big three. So you've got people, pastures and cows, and uh, potentially um, pastures is our cheapest source of... Uh, quality feed that we can give to our dairy cows. And within BWB, we have a strong focus on pasture utilisation. It probably underpins a lot of uh, what drives our profitability. So in that end, we um, have a model around uh, stocking to the highest stocking rates that cows can eat with grass and using supplements to fill in the, the shoulders there so that we can and those supplements are used not only to fully feed the cows, but also to um, use, can be used to ex improve your growth, uh, growth rates further uh, in terms of um, lengthening rotations and that sort of thing. So we, we, we do take uh, pastures seriously. Um, Monitoring is a really important part uh, in terms of... Uh, the guys that uh, manage our farms, they do weekly farm walks, uh, which are plated. Um, that's, actually, that's actually one of the few requirements we ask of the farmers. And that information, um, we actually use it through a program called Agrinet, which is really our recording and planning model. Um, so that gives us our feed wedges, um, gives you feedback on your rotation that, you, that you're on gives you the opportunity to look forward as well. Uh, obviously, uh, we've collected average uh, pasture cuts. Um, monitoring the change is an average pasture cut. It's an idea of uh, planning. Are they lifting? Are they going down? Um, pre and post uh, grazings. Uh, it's important in terms of, uh, of our uh, quality of feed that we're presenting to the cows. So use uh, the Agronet for longer term feed budgeting. Um, that I use pasture rotation planners, and yeah. it's probably how we we put that focus back on to growing and utilising the, the feed, our key one. And Fran. <laughs> Um, we do, uh, we're quite a young uh, company, Prime's quite young, so we're just learning to put all these systems in place. So we also have a, a weekly, uh, weekly report. Um, uh, some of our really experienced managers do plate every week and input data. Um, I help 
the for other managers and we don't actually we twice a week we measure three in front and three behind and get an average um, we are mm, developing systems I suppose to try and encourage and we just all want to learn and be better we want to eat as much grass as we can um, every 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 round I suppose and so in spring we focused really hard on leaf stage because that was really quick and easy way for a manager that was unsure we could just look at uh, look at what paddock we were going into what our leaf stage was and it can give us an indication if we do going too fast or or too slow um, to, to, uh, we are struggling sometimes to um, uh, explain the importance and to try and get, uh, we call them any managers, so we have a few any managers who love the inside and they love being in the dairy and um, uh, learning and teaching them to go outside and look at their cows and look at their eating, look when they're full, um, trying to get some measurables so we can plan. Um, it's difficult, so I really like grass and it's fun for me to measure and we do a lot of growth rate all the time to just see where we are. Um, it, was, it was fun, it was the best, but my role now is mainly people, because I'm trying to you know, motivate them to understand the importance. And then there's a huge correlation of the, the more grass we've eaten, the more profitable the farm. It's, it's like, it's, it's, it's astonishing. And so our experience managers are like, um, hugely profitable and our less experienced managers are we really struggling actually to make a return. So. Excellent, thank you. So um, what, so this is a question for everybody. So we've seen, we've got the picture up on the screen of, um, of our homegrown feed for the past 10 years. What, what do you think the future is for pasture-based dairy farming? Do we, are we able to progress? Are we sort of sitting where we're going to get? Do you see pasture-based dairy farming fading away as people look at more um, intensive systems or getting more per cow production? So, Rich, start with that. No, but I can. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, in terms of that question, Leslie, I, I, I do, and I think Simon touched on that, there is certainly you know, the underlying profitability of any farming system is making use of your assets, and we've touched on that, and John's touched on that. That's your pastures, your land capital, your human capital, your, your staff and your cows. So I don't think we don't want to pull them apart. They're all integrated. Um, but definitely, I think, if you look at... And there's a probably a reason why Tasmania's had growth in the dairy industry and our national pool has declined, and I think it's on the back that we've utilised our, our comparative advantage to produce homegrown feed well. Um, is there more opportunity to do that? I think, you know, we look at the efforts around, you know, the farm work that's here, but also where we look at our benchmarking effort and we can see that people are, are doing that well, but we must understand tipping points that come with that as well. So whilst I think we've seen, whether through our genetic improvements, but even in our environment, I know you can go back and look at some of the climate modelling we've done. Tassie was very well buffered against the predictions we looked at 15 years ago around climate and particularly with the water developments in the state. And so... I'm not surprised to see that the growth that we've seen in the industry, I think what we need to challenge ourselves on is whilst that creates a lot of cash capital for us, so we've got to make, maintain that, that margin, you know, we've got to keep our cost of production under control and, and grass is a key driver of that um, and that'll keep. we also got to understand that we can't erode other parts of our wealth, which is our social wealth and our environmental wealth and I think we just need to be mindful about tipping points as we approach those higher levels and that's why I suppose the farmers have got that stretch target of you know, 2,000 kilos of milk solids, 20 tonne grown, but not just doing it through an erosion of our environmental capital where we're creating more nitrate losses to the environment stuff. So yeah, I, I definitely supportive of where pastures go and I think there is lots of opportunity, yeah. um, but we've got to do those things well. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. And we'll come back to some of those tipping points. Yeah. Um, Deb, did you want to add anything? How do you follow that? <laughs> 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 so, I, so I'll go. I'll, I'll touch on quite a few of those things when we were talking. So, yeah. So we were out at Rushy Lagoon. So you were on sand, and uh, we have a thousand acres. And every ten days, we walk the 
pastures. Um, it, uh, John was our consultant, so he was keeping, uh, keeping us in line there. So we had to... Um, but it's a passion. The wrong person is here. My husband should be here because he's the one that did it all. But um, that... <sighs> We made money out of it and we didn't feed one ounce of grain. We were on that 12 tonne. Uh, we had probably better weather. So it's horses for courses on what you're doing. We had lots of irrigation um, and it grew most of the year. So there's quite a few things there that are probably different for different regions of, uh, of what we're looking at. But yeah, it's um, getting the staff to do it. You've got to be mindful of that. And uh, we had a, we actually had a blue heeler dog that went with everybody. Plate, plate, cool it, plate meter come out and the dog was there. So yeah, we, I, I always said to my husband, I wish we could get utilise that. You know, because <laughs> that knew where to go. So, but now with tech, <laughs> technology and everything that we've got, um, we should be able to utilise it much, much better. But I do think it's the, I think it's the way to go. So, yeah. Yeah, I think um, we have to remember in a in a in a big corporate. I think we try to just set a really simple, low activity model. So some of the like high input, uh, really hard mass based decisions or growing uh, is really hard for us to do. So we have to think to grow more grass, we have to have a really simple low activity, uh, an easy decision to make. And we have to have patterns and people that under understand those. So, um, so for, for, for Prime specifically to grow more food, we will be doing that next year and the year after and the year after because we're putting in just a, a simple, a, a, just a simple plan on our farm that um, we only have to make very few decisions and we are, we are looking at lots of different systems to help us with that and we keep just going back to um, plate metering and putting it in Excel. It seems um, we're quite worried about um, uh, sort of things that give you information because it's all good and well if someone can move the cars from their bed or their sofa and put a break up but if no one's looking then we might and it's only dependent on one person then we will get into a pickle fairly quickly so we're trying to we're doing a few things to grow more, more grass and I think we'll keep growing we're going to put some more clover in and just slowly um, introduce some diversity um, we've got really wet farms, so for us to grow and keep growing, we have to be really careful in winter. So we've, um, um, so we are wintering a lot more than we have been. Uh, we're going to lean on standoff areas. Uh, we've got some feed pads going in. We just that first contra controlled uh, round that um, spring rotation plan is absolutely essential. And if we make a, a mistake on that, it's that our whole system, our whole season is impacted. So for, for our grass con conserving and making sure that rye plant ha hasn't died is in, that, in that first round is the key for our, our sweat farmers and to, to grow more. Yeah. And John, what do you think about the future of pasture-based dairy farming? Well, let's touch on where we've been. I mean, I looked at that graph that you sent me, Leslie, in 10 years, I'd say as farmers, we haven't come very far. <laughs> And that's, uh, that actually shocked me a bit because I had this perception that we were just going up and up and up and that per cow's going up. And, but even the per cow hasn't changed much. Stocking rates haven't changed much. We're not utilising much more feed than we were 10 years ago. Um, and you've got to question why. Um, or you look at it the other way. We've got uh, all of these technologies. I saw a Squibby there before with the, with the flash new pastures. You're growing a small grass. Um, We've got our pivot irrigators that's meant to use less water and grow more grass. Um, what else have we got? We've got uh, all of the training that comes through the departments and uh, TIA and that sort of thing. Uh, we've got uh, Fert Smart now, so we're using our fertiliser better. Um, we've got uh, satellites, we've got drones, we've got uh, fences you can't even see. <laughs> That might be a good thing, because I wouldn't be, when I drive through the bungee cords all the time, you know. <laughs> and, you know, we can fill our phone up with just numerous apps. But with all of this, I mean, the, the challenge, and I'll put the challenge out there, is that we're not going anywhere. 
So what's, what's the issue? What's the, what's the sticking point? And we've seen here today, you know, on this research farm there, that they're, they've already grown 14 tonne and we're not even finished the season yet, you know, and uh, doing fantastic production. So, I mean, I've, I've got to look at, uh, as a manager of a farm, what am I doing? You know? And the interesting thing with that data, and if you get a chance to look at it in more detail, that same amount of pasture utilised is irrespective of the, of the seasons. So it doesn't matter how, whether we've got a good rain or a low rain, we're basically utilising the same amount of feed. Now, I, don't work that, I can't work that one out, but we always say, oh, we had a bad season or we had a good season, but it's always the same. And it doesn't matter on that data there whether we put on 150 kilos of N or 300 kilos of N. We're still utilising the same amount of feed. So where's the sticking point? And I'm probably a bit hot on this because uh, i just come back from New Zealand from a study tour and, um, yeah, I, I won't harp on about the Kiwis and their grazing management, but um, I would say that it's at a higher level and I was trying to work out some of the things that, where, where their focus was. And um, we went to a farm uh, that was using halter and uh, Luke was over there, and this guy was an exceptional in his grazing management, and uh, so we were trying to work out is it the halter that's actually done all of this. And what I actually said was, one of his comments was just interesting, is that um, he actually checks his feeding level of his cows more regularly through the day. So he checks that they have got enough feed, or if they haven't quite got enough feed, it's very easy for him to give them a bit more. Um, and what he said is that Halter's actually freed up some time to do this. And I was thinking about that, and I was thinking about what I do running around all day, and I was thinking, I haven't got time to go down there and check the cows all the time. Maybe, maybe time's our issue. Maybe that's part of it. Um, we want to do it, but there's always some other urgent matter in, in front of us. So um, I don't know whether high milk prices make us lazy. It's easier to get a margin. Um, Maybe a, a lower milk price might improve our focus. Um, but if, if we're not going to increase above 10 and a half tonne, we might as well not be spending money on, sorry, Squibby, your grass seed. <laughs> we might as well not be spending the money on fish irrigators. Because <laughs> you might as well just put that money in your pocket. <laughs> But I, don't, I, I see, and I mean we're seeing that, the, that there is potential to move forward. Um, and just, if I just have one more minute, uh, there was some benchmarking done in New Zealand where they were actually, de they actually demonstrated, and someone alluded to the correlation between uh, EBIT figures, um, profit figures versus past utilisation. And their, their correlation at a $9 payout was for every one tonne of improvement in um, past utilisation was worth about 830 New Zealand dollars, probably about 800 over here, and you think, oh, well, that's good. But then you multiply that out by the average size dairy farm at the moment, and we're talking about $225,000 for one tonne increase. So um, there's serious money to be made there. And the other, the other point that came out of that New Zealand data was in a point that the presenter made was that maybe we shouldn't be comparing ourselves to other people because our farms may not be have the same soil resources or water resources but the important thing is probably comparing year to year in your own operation and i think we've got to be mindful can we can we do that by getting cows to eat better and eat more grass, and that's a role of technologies, or do we just do it by putting more cows into the landscape and then we've got to understand how many cows in the catchment, and then we've got our challenges around seasonal calving with how we deal with non-replacement dairy calves. So whilst I think there's a lot of um, aspects of grass-fed systems that give us a real great advantage in the marketplace, I think our products are high quality, they're sourced very well, and we can make good money from grass-fed farming. We've just got to make sure that we're solving those other challenges we we go along and most of them are going to come from how we actually keep getting that improvement in grass utilisation by not creating challenges that we can't unwind and so everyone's talked to you David you're going to show them, you know when we brief for new grasses and that they come with the need to have 
more nitrogen go into the system to grow that. If you're going to grow two tonne more, then where's that coming from? I think what we're looking now is can we get that through the way that we grow with, with our um, mixes in species? And so I think we've just got to think about what we're trying to achieve when we create a higher producing cow or a higher producing ryegrass and make sure that we solve some of those other challenges along the way and have that in our thinking. But I agree, there's a lot of room for us to go to grab more opportunities as well. Yeah. We see there the, um, the charts around uh, past year growth and consumption and things like that, and, and John was very right in appearing to be pretty stagnant uh, for the last probably 10 years. What, what do you think could potentially be our um, average for Tasmania, um, knowing that it's very regional specific in a lot of cases? Can, can we bump those average yields up realistically to, to probably 12 tonne? Um, and with that in mind, what is going to be the, uh, the hold back to us? If you look at where we're at with the top 25 in that benchmarking, then they're already there. Um, so part of that, I think we've got to do that in a way. And France touched this, you know, for some, some areas around winter management becomes really important because if you start stocking at three cows a hectare and just for easy numbers, the cows are eating four tonne, that gets you to 12. But your farm not, might not cope with any more than three and a half because of just the way winter management comes. So drainage becomes an issue in that or having the ability to gist off. And so you've got to take those systems parts there. What we do know and, and is that our environment is conducive to growing a lot more. So, you, you know, each year the, the daylight hours and the number of temperatures we get, we might get it. And we've taken out a lot of the volatility in our climate just through our irrigation developments. So that consistency year in, year out, it's about how we optimise that given the constraints that we've got, and they might be constraints around our, our land use or where you position and things like that, but there's definitely growth to go. We've just got to make sure that we don't do that and create ourselves unnecessary challenges along the way. Question for the whole panel, Leslie, and I've been around a while, and John, you and I worked on the 2012 project years ago, and Richard was around, and so were you, Leslie, and we really focused on pasture skills. Do you reckon we've lost some of our pasture skills? and pasture management skills in the last few years? I think the answer is yes. Definitely. Um, yeah. <laughs> but I, I, I think there's a, there's a changing environment. Yeah, I mean, 20 years ago, most farms were operated with a family, family farm. Um, a lot of that expertise is uh, gone when the farms were sold, and a lot of the corporates uh, that are bought in um, are lacking the level of management. Uh, I know we would uh, probably, the difficult thing in our operations, the managers and the two ICs. So yeah, I, I think that there's the need for um, not only the training but the, the, the passion and the desire in those people to actually learn and understand uh, the, the basics of grazing management. And some of the shortcuts are good but I think we need to get back to a few fundamentals as well. Um, so I've come back into the industry and I, I was shocked driving around. So when I was with Fonterra and I covered the state pretty well, I, I, was a, I thought it was pretty good. But I've come back into this industry and uh, probably in a position now that we can get some courses and things going because I, I, am, I am shocked at the lack of um, probably not being able to go out there and eyeball the yeah. pasture, um, the quality of the pasture, because to, to, to utilise your pasture, you've got to have good pasture. I mean, you know, you're not going to eat rump steak uh, over scotch and neither are the cows. So um, we need to, you know, we do need to do it properly. So, yeah. Um, it's, it's super important to have everyone... Like, I think we've been buffered, lots of us, like... We're getting 400 sides a cow, but it's irrelevant sometimes of the grass because we've got so many supplements in there. We're using many, many things to buffer us. So if we make a grass mistake, it's irrelevant because whoever's looking at that milk in the tank, just like, oh, yeah, they're going well. But it's irrelevant because that milk is from silage or bought food or palm kernel, and we're not... Yeah, it's... it's I'm finding that... Um, it's hard to, um, if, if a manager isn't bought into the excitement of growing grass and making a profit, so I want a resilient, robust system that I want to go to work in Tagari for Prime for 10 years, so we have to keep going forward and, you know, making a profit. And 
we are investing heaps of time in our junior staff. So the expectation, we're just putting expectations up for managers to our C's. Like the expectation is the milk in the vat you are putting there. So even if you're level three or level four and you go into the paddock and you get in the cars, you might not be able to say to your manager, I think we're leaving 1650. But you can say uh, there was some silage left over and there's some there's still some grass there, or you can say, the cows were at the gate and they were screaming at me, <laughs> and like, I can see that, like, they have to be responsible, too, for bringing, if the manager isn't there, or the, you know, they need to, and so we try to, we, 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 we're plating together as, as a team, and we've also put another labour unit in, so we really, did, like, our cost of labour is quite a lot because we've given the manager time. We're trying to give them time. Sometimes it doesn't work when we go to town, but sometimes <laughs> it, um, it is working. And um, they, um, so a, a few of our really um, new staff members, um, they, um, they, like on my, I have a group at the Harkas, so um, I have three Filipinos and two Colombians. Our English is poor. We cannot drive a tractor, but we're moving 2,000 cars every day, and every day they do a, a video of residual mm. and a video pre-graze, and we discuss mm. what we've left, and we move, uh, so we are uh, grazing through deferred grass at the moment, so we're changing every day by 0.2 or 0.1 of a hectare because we have an easy app like the field app measure. And so we're giving 1.5 to this group, 1.2 to this group, and, they, and we say, oh my God, look what they've left. <laughs> cut them back. And then we you know, cut and watch, and, and then there's a huge debate. And sometimes you can't actually follow it because the English is so bad. <laughs> but like everyone really cares. And so if we have that teaching, like hopefully we're growing some TICs and managers in those people. Yeah. Just a question relating to the resources and whether we're utilising resources. I was just wondering if there'd been some sort of yield gap analysis depending on what those resources are available, what that theoretical yield should be, and then for those farmers in that situation, are they attaining that theoretical yield? Um, or is it, are they actually capped at their resources? And is that, are we moving out into more marginal land, which means that there's you know, uh, potentially lower potential for that, uh, a lower yield potential and therefore potentially evening out that um, production level. Yeah, I'll have a go. Um, yeah, so, rule of thumb, and but for every 100 mils of rainfall, you generally get about a tonne of pasture. Now, if that's all winter dominant, then maybe not, but just take that as a will. So, 1,000 rainfall environment should grow about 10 tonne and if we look at our water requirements for those and filling gaps and you know our ability to grow 16, 17 tonne is there. Um, are we looking to change that? If we look at how much milk production we've got across the state and those figures, to everyone's point in this panel, I'm not sure we're growing our milk from more pasture unless we're increasing more land and that would be an interesting analysis in itself or how much of our milk is marginal milk that we're coming from purchase feeds into our systems. So we need to understand that because I think that is where the opportunity for growth is. I have no issue with someone feeding six kilos or no kilos of grain, as long as they're going ahead in terms of the way they're managing and harvesting the pasture because that'll be the underlying driver of the profit. If that's going in the wrong direction, that's a problem. And so I think the yield gap exists. My question probably would be back is, what is an appropriate yield gap to have? Because there is challenges that comes with the maximisation of that. Another bit's the tip, whether it's labour, whether it's environment, whether it's animal welfare or even animal health and things. And so we've got to use those knowledges and technologies because our products globally in demand, only about 10 or 15% of milk in the world is produced from grass. We don't want to erode that advantage in other ways. I look at this and I, I do start to get a little bit, you know, have we reached the limit? But I know from projects that we've been involved in um, from 2012 and like talking with, with you guys um, from Dairy on Par. So John, I think you used the word focus. And so if we, and, and Fran, you said about getting people excited about and passionate about um, managing their pasture and, and getting excited about, you know, 
is this the appropriate residual or are we going into the right time? So we've seen through um, projects that we've worked on in the dairy industry that if you do have that focus and that excitement about growing grass, um, then it does make a difference. If you're actively managing it, um, it makes a difference and you can improve. Even if you've had you know, 20 or 30 years of experience, if you get back to that passion for managing pasture, um, it makes a difference and we will see um, it go ahead on your farm and hopefully the industry averages as well. So I want to say a huge thank you to each of you for coming along and discussing that. Um, please feel free to have a chat with them over, over lunch. Um, yeah, thank you. <laughs>